Paul's friends in 1 Corinthians 16, and I just want to say again, I know I've said this probably three, three weeks in a row, but I just really want to encourage you. I pray that your closest friends you have are people in church. And the closest friends I pray you have are people that have a heart for God and are serving the Lord. And uh, Paul made time to mention Timotheus or Timothy uh, to the church at Corinth. His goal was to send Timothy there to minister to them. And of course, Timothy was very familiar with that church. He was right there in the thick and thin with Paul. And uh, as he got that ministry started, there was a difficult ministry to get started with. But Silas and Paul, uh, Timothy got down there. In fact, when they got there, they were shot in the arm to Paul. And then we, we see where Paul makes mention of Apollos and he considered Apollos just a very, you know, he had, a, he had a great respect for Apollos as perhaps one of the great preachers of the first century, a very powerful preacher, and had great influence there at the church at Corinth and great influence at the church at Ephesus, and he acknowledges him and says some things about him. The last week we looked at the fact that Paul gave acknowledgement to some laymen, and they were people, they were just typical members of the church there that uh, went, that traveled all the way from Corinth down to Ephesus to see Paul, to give him a report concerning the state of affairs at Corinth, which was not very good. But they didn't, you know, they didn't break down the church, and they, didn't, they, weren't, they, were, they came with a broken heart, and they said, Paul, we don't know what to do. We need your help here. And, and Paul makes mention about Stephanus, who was the first fruits of Achaia, and I don't know if you noticed it, but in Romans chapter 16, he mentions about another man, which I didn't have time to talk about, Eponidas, who was also of the first fruits of Achaicus, and, and just, uh, you know, Achaia, Achaia there. And you, and you look at that, and you wonder, Dude, these people are just great people. And he, and he talks about Stephanus, and he talks about Fortunatus, and Achaicus there. But now we get to this last, this last, this last group here. Here. In verse 19, he talks about this couple that uh, had some, that spent some time with him there at the church at Corinth. Their names were Achilla and Priscilla. And everywhere you find them mentioned, it's always Achilla and Priscilla and Priscilla and Achilla. You never find them separate. You always find them inseparable. You always find them together. You always find them serving together and doing things together. They are a husband-wife team that epitomized to me a model serving team in a local New Testament church. Now, when you study the Bible, the Bible records for us some very, very um, uh, helpful lessons about husband and wife teams. Some of them are famous. Some of them are infamous. I think beginning right at the beginning of the Bible, we have the story of Adam and Eve. Uh, we have uh, Isaac and Rebekah. We, uh, we have Jacob and his two wives. We have, uh, later on, we go a little bit further in the Bible, we have Abraham and Sarah. We have Boaz and Ruth. We have David and Bathsheba. We have Ahab and Jezebel, a very infamous couple. Uh, we have the great woman of Shunem. We're not told her name, but she's called the great woman of Shunem and her husband. We're told about Zacharias and Elizabeth, the parents of John the Baptist. We know, of course, about Joseph and Mary. Uh, we read about Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5. Again, another infamous couple. And yet, one we probably would forget about, found in the book of Philemon, would be Philemon and his wife Aphia. And I think in many ways they model Achilla and Priscilla. All of these couples are famous and infamous. I think as we consider the ministry of Paul, who was a single man as far as we know, Paul took time in his mentoring and his discipling with what little time he had to focus on both individuals as well as couples. He was concerned that the bedrock of a church would be made up of serving couples, of spiritual couples, of husbands and wives who love the Lord. And as you see here, Paul, and I, and I think a lot of this, as you think about the characters that came into Paul's life and some of the things that the Lord uses in life, you can't help but wonder and imagine that when you get to Ephesians 5, and Paul does this wonderful layout in Ephesians 5 about raising, about husband and wives and about, about um, you know, raising children. You kind of wonder if, a, if, if maybe Achille and Priscilla were part of that seed thought. He watched them, and they were part of the seed thought that the Lord implant, embedded in his mind about writing about what, what makes up a godly marriage and a good marriage for God's glory. And, of course, we know God, marriage is God's will for companionship. We believe that. We understand. We'll say something about that a little bit later. But, you know, we also have to realize that as we, we look at this, this couple tonight, when we look at them, we just recognize that marriage is wonderful. To be able to serve the Lord with someone that you love and to be able to have at your side someone who loves God and loves the work of God. They love the church and prays with you. That's a wonderful thing. But I also want to say marriage is wonderful, but marriage is also work. It's a lot of work. Marriage is relationship work. You've got to work at it all the time. It's communication work. You've got to communicate. It's housework. I mean, there's a lot of housework that's involved. There's parenting work and it's teamwork. And as we look at Achille and Priscilla, we see teamwork. We see a married couple deeply rooted in the Lord, serving our Lord in the church and special friends to their pastor. Tonight, I want you to notice as we see from Romans 16 and 1 Corinthians 16, I want you to notice with me this evening, a married couple that put their necks on the line for the Lord. And that's kind of just a good way of starting off the year. They put their necks 
on the line for the Lord. I want you to see four things tonight. Four very simple thoughts tonight. Number one, I want you to see the heirs together. I want you to see the heirs together. Now, Peter, Peter has an interesting phrase that he uses to describe being married couples, and he defines it. It's only used one time in the Bible. He uses this in 1 Peter 3, 7. He talks to the wives in verses 1 to 6 about their relationship to their husband and working on their heart and realizing that the adornment of the heart is very important and, and the ornament of a, of a meek and quiet spirit. And he talks about submission and talks about their testimony, especially if they have an unsaved husband and how that testimony is so essential for getting him saved. And then he has just one verse for the husband, and when he, when he gets there, it doesn't, say, it doesn't mean that everything he said about the wives in the first six verses are, are to be forgotten, but really he says, likewise, he's saying, hey, the same principles about the heart that I mentioned to the wife also come over and apply to the husband. And he says in 1 Peter 3, 7, likewise, ye husbands, he says, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and is being, listen to this, as heirs together of the grace of life. Now, that's a wonderful phrase that Peter uses. I don't think we, we give much thought to it, but it's a great thought. It's the name of one of our, our growth groups, Heirs Together. It's a wonderful description of a married couple. Heirs together of the grace of life. They're both saved. They're both under the grace of God. Uh, the word heirs refers to the fact that both of them are on level playing ground in terms of the fact that they're saved and their children are sons of God. Together refers to the fact that they're companions and they're partners and they're soulmates in the blessing of God. When I think of heirs together, I think of Aquila and Priscilla. Here was a couple that were just together about everything. I mean, together about everything they did. They were together about their love. They were inseparable in their love. They modeled the two that became one. Matthew chapter 19 gives us probably one of the great passages there that has to be read in conjunction with Genesis chapter, chapter 2 about marriage there. And when we think about the love a married couple has, which is essential, we cannot, we cannot overlook the fact that, that marriage is grounded in the marriage covenant, that that covenant is the exchange of the oath between the husband and wife, that they've pledged their, wife, their lives to each other, they're committed to one another, and there's this covenant that's not to be broken. The covenant was meant to be fulfilled and exercised. There's a the covenant in their love. They were companions in their love. The Bible says this in Amos 3.3, can two walk together except they be agreed. You know, for a married couple to come together, they must be agreed, number one, about the Lord Jesus Christ. They both need to be saved. They both need to be under the blood of Jesus Christ. They need to be agreed about Jesus Christ. They need to be agreed about the Bible. You can't have one that believes that they, they, can, they, can, they can have a King James Bible and understand that's the preserved word of God, and another, the other one who says, well, I'd rather use some other, uh, other version, some contemporary version, which has flaws in it and missing verses in that nature. You're not together. You're not together if you have a different philosophy about salvation. Hey, by the way, you're not together if you have a different philosophy as a married couple about the local New Testament church. You've got to be the same about the church. You've got to be the same about serving God. You've got to be the same about all these things. That's why Amos 3.3 said, can two walk together except they be agreed? And as we get into this tonight, you're going to notice that Aquila and Priscilla were a couple that were very much together about the spiritual things of God. There's something else here. We see their commitment. The Bible tells us about commitment in Matthew chapter chapter 19, as Jesus talks about, he carries over some of the verses that we find in Genesis chapter 2 about marriage. He goes on by saying this, and what God has brought together, let no man put asunder. Now when he says no man put asunder, he's talking about the commitment that's involved with the marriage relation. Now if you marry right, and you live right, and your fellowship with God is right, you don't even entertain the thought about parting ways or breaking off, things of that nature. That's, that, by the way, people who think that way, that's how the world thinks. That's not how Christians are supposed to think. Christians are supposed to be thinking this way, I'm in it for life. Anybody you date is a potential marriage partner. Single people, they're a potential marriage partner. You don't treat it flimsily like this is this way and that way and that way. That is not the model God wants. The model God wants for you is you realize this is a relationship that you're going to be committed to. Now, commitment means you're in it for life. Commitment means you're, you've got, you're not in it 50-50. You're in it 100-100. Now, realize this. Every married couple has faults. And the older they get, the longer they're married, they recognize the fault. But you know what they learn all over the time? Those faults are not as bad as they really thought they were. They just learn to live with it. They learn the fact that they can deal with it. And God gives them special grace concerning that. But there's this commitment level that needs to be done. You notice the kill and Priscilla? They were committed. I mean, everything we have about them, they're together. Uh, they're consolidated. They, were, they model what it meant where two became one. They were consolidated. They were commended. The Bible says, uh, the Bible says marriage is honorable and all. I mean, God exalts marriage. 
marriage. It doesn't matter if someone, if a state or a federal government passes a law redefining marriage. Whatever they say, doesn't com- it conflicts with the word of God if, it, if it's something other than the word of God. God's word is to be held preeminent concerning marriage. It doesn't matter if someone else redefines marriage in some other way. Whatever they redefine, they basically are slapping God in the face and saying, God, your word doesn't work. I'm going to tell you tonight, God's word does work when it comes to marriage. Now, Achilles loved Priscilla as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. I want to say that right front. Aquila loved Priscilla as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. I can't help but think that as Paul lived with them and watched them, he's, look, he's just watched how Aquila just loved on his wife. But I want to say this about Priscilla. I believe Priscilla submitted herself unto her own husband as unto the Lord. Now there's a joke that goes around in a lot of circles that where the husband's the head, but the wife is the neck that turns the head. That may be a joke, but honestly it's not funny. It's honestly not funny. That's a sign of a woman that is insubordinate to her husband and is out of the will of God, if you believe that. I'm sorry to say that, but that's what it is. And you look at the word of God, I mean, Achille and Priscilla, they modeled Ephesians chapter 5. They treated their marriage as wise investors where they put more in than they took out. They put more in than what they took out. Now I want you to see some of those. They were heirs together in their love, but they were heirs together in their labor. When we first have this first mention of them, you find it over in Acts chapter 18. The Bible goes out of the way to tell us they were tent makers. They made a living. They had a business. They were good at making tents. Today, married couples, many of them, especially here in California, both have to work jobs in order to pay bills and prepare for their futures. And understand that. In those days, many, many of them had a family business. That's a good thing. It uh, can be a bad thing, too, if they're not together. But uh, they, they had a family business. I believe they worked hard. I believe they learned to develop good people skills from that. Uh, they gave a good product to the public. Brother Eugene Jr. was telling me that he just took on a job. He told me about the job, and I was commending him about it. I said, good, I, I, brother, I'm glad you took the job. I don't know how long you'll stay at it. You know, that's between you and God, but uh, you know, I pray that you, you, you know, you'll learn good people skills and, and that you'll learn to think on your feet. There's a lot of good things about doing that and having a business taught them all those things. They developed good people skills. They knew the importance of giving a good product to the public and having a good name, a good reputation among the saved as well as the unsaved. And here they are making their tents, and I'm not sure everything that's involved with all the fabric and things and animal skins. I'm not sure everything they did there, but here they are right there in the public marketplace. They've got their, they've got their, their tents out there, and they're, they're, you know, they're, they're just, you know, they're, they've got their, their goods out there, and they're making it on the backside here. And here comes this little Jewish guy that they didn't know who he was from Adam. He comes by, and he noticed that they were tent makers. He took a look at them. He says, I think they may be Jewish like me. He strikes up a conversation with them, and uh, they found out they had a lot of things in common. They found out they were both, they, they, Paul and Achille and Priscilla both found out they were Jews. They were both tent makers, and Paul probably says something like this, I imagine. He says, oh, he says, those are great-looking tents. He probably says somebody is, you know, back when I was a kid, my dad was a tent maker, and I made tents too, and they kind of struck up a conversation. Then they started finding out by the, by the accents they had that they were both Jewish. They were both Hebrew, and they probably started talking Hebrew, and they started talking about locations, where are you from, and who's your family, and all those kind of things. They found out that he was a Pharisee, and a number of things like that. And uh, after a period of time, they both found out they were born again. Praise God. Amen. They found they were born again. They were saved. And uh, as they were talking, Paul said, well, why are you here in Corinth? And they said, because we got kicked out of Rome. Why did you get kicked out of Rome? Because Claudius said that there were some troublemaking Jews that were promoting a man by the name of Christos. Christos meaning Jesus Christ. He didn't like the fact there were Christian Jews getting, spreading the gospel and witnessing there. He said, we got kicked out. We were told our visas would be revoked, and we were kicked out of Rome. And so here we are in Corinth because this is a thriving marketplace. But to be honest with you, Paul, we knew this would be a good place for business, but we also thought it would be a good place to preach the gospel because we didn't come here just to make money. We came here to make disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen? And so they went there deciding on that. Well, Paul said, well, funny that you should say that because the very reason why I'm down here in Corinth is I'm here on a survey trip to stay down here because I'm intent on starting a church here. I don't know anybody down here. I was praying along the way that God would give me some helpers and some people along the way, and I guess God brought you along the way and introduced me to you. And they started talking. They said, by the way, they said, by the way, 
Uh, how are you paying your bills, Paul? Where are you staying at? He said, well, you know what? I don't have a place to stay, but you know, God will take care of my needs. I mean, God's been good to me all along the way. And he said, you know, we're our church. I came from a good church, and I pretty much have spent up all my, my offering money that they gave me to get me along the way. And honestly, I just need to go to work and do something. And they said, well, if you need a job, you need to go to work. They said, Paul, why don't you stay here, and why don't you work with us? And listen, we will, we'll make tents together, and tell you what, you can stand right next to us, and, and I'll give you a piece, of, a piece of the action. I'll give you some commission for whatever you pay. And Paul said, are you sure you want to do a thing like that? They said, we're sure we want to do a thing. I mean, God knit their hearts together because here were two hardworking individuals that wanted to do something and, and, and pay their bills and so forth. But more importantly, they started talking. The more they talked, they realized they both had a burden for the city of Corinth and reaching souls for Jesus Christ. They were laborers. They invited him into their business to work and help them make and sell tents. He never had an intention of taking over their business. He had never had an intention or motive of wanting to be a part of the business. I mean, he accepted the invitation, but he said, I'm only going to stay here long enough to pay my bills because I'm not here to be doing tent making. I'm here to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ here. I remind of a statement that Winston Churchill made. We make a living by what we get, but you'll make a life by what you give. And I'm reminded here that that's what was going on here with Paul, Aquila, and Priscilla. We see these heirs together in their love and these heirs together in their labor. Notice this. We see these heirs together and their Lord. They knew the Lord. They were there because they were intent of having the city of Corinth. I mean, they had on their heart the same thing that Paul had on his heart. This was a city that needed to hear the gospel. This was a city that needed Jesus Christ. And whatever way, whichever way we can, we just feel like we're here. We're going to pay our own bills our own way. We're going to get it done down here. When I look at the friendship between Paul and Achilles Priscilla, you know the most important common denominator is the fact they both knew the Lord. They both loved the Lord. A lot of people can be, they can make friends with anybody, anytime, be, buddy up with things, but, you know, I just would tell you this, and you saw that tonight, I mean, it's, it's just, the Lord led Brother Eugene to preach Psalms 1-1, but the Bible starts off in Psalms 1-1, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Now, I want you to understand something, when you read Psalms chapter 1, we get all happy about verses 1-3, to three, but when you look at the entire chapter, the whole chapter is dealing about the problem with the ungodly. Because when you look at Psalms, Psalms chapter 1, I think there's about Psalms 30 or so, it, it deals with, with the, it, it talks about man, about the godly and the ungodly. That's what it deals with all the time, the godly and the ungodly. Because he goes on later in verse 4 and he says, but the ungodly are not so. Bless the man who walks down the council of ungodly. Or stand at the way of sinners. Or sit at the seat of the scornful. I'm telling you, the temptation is great there. The temptation is great to be under the counsel and advice of someone who doesn't know the Lord. The temptation is great to stand in the same line with the sinners and go in the same direction with them. The, the temptation is great to be around somebody who has always something negative to say. They're always scornful about something. There. They've got nothing good to say. They're always scornful. And the Bible says, bless the man, happy is the man who's not around those groups of people there. Kill and Priscilla knew the Lord. They wanted to be around people that knew the Lord. They had a marriage that glorified the Lord. Listen, the, the, the baseline of their marriage was the Lord. The foundation of their marriage was the Lord. Everything about them was the Lord. Their marriage revolved around the Lord and not the Lord around their marriage. I'm saying tonight, we see heirs together. But notice, secondly, we see helpers. They were Paul's helpers. Paul said in Romans 16, 3, he calls them, my, he says, greet or salute Aquila, Priscilla, my helpers in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul liked using that word helper quite a bit, and he used that with about Fortunatus and Stephanus and those, those people there. Where Paul uses it, he refers to people as fellow laborers, fellow companions, companions and laborers, laborers together. It's what he uses in 1 Corinthians 3.9. In an earlier chapter, we were laborers together. We get our word, as I mentioned last week, we get our word synergy from that. Paul said they were my helpers. We coalesced together. We synergized together. We blended together. They complimented me. I complimented them. We worked together in getting the job done. I mean, they both had strengths that they, mag they magnified. They both had weaknesses, and the other compensated for the weaknesses. They didn't try to overcome or conquer the weakness. They compensated. You know, there's a difference when, you, when you're trying to mentor somebody, work with them. There's one day, you know, when we're younger... Our goal is to conquer that weakness. We want to just show them they're wrong. But as you get older and a little more mature, you realize it's part of the learning process. Your goal is not to conquer that weakness by being overpowering them. Your goal is to compensate for that weakness by loving them and helping them along the way that they discover along the way how God's grace is at work in their life, even as God's grace is at work in your life and mine. Now notice something here about their helpers. Notice first of all in Romans Acts 18.26. I want you to look at that. He says, first, we see them as a help to Apollos. 
The Bible says, and he began to speak boldly, speaking about Apollos, he began to speak boldly in a synagogue whom when Achille and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. Now here's what's going on. Achille and Priscilla accompanied Paul to Ephesus. Now, many months have gone by, now, at least 20 months have gone by since they started at Corinth. And Paul said, I want you to go with me. And I appreciate their heart when you study this out. They, they just immediately just close up shop. Whatever orders were pending, they told all those people, sorry, we can't deliver it for you. Or they gave it to somebody else. And they basically closed shop. Out of their own pocket, they paid the fare to board a ship. Traveled with Paul, probably paid his fare as well. Went across the, uh, uh, the, the inlet there over to Ephesus. And there they accompanied Paul and starting a work there. And for whatever reason, Paul abruptly told them, I need to move on. The Lord's put on my heart. I can't stay here very long. Ultimately, if you read the rest of Acts 18, he makes his way back to Antioch to give a report to the church at Antioch about things. He's going back home. If you, We call it today a furlough. He went back for a short furlough to go back and tell him what the work of God was. And so, so here they are, uh, Kill and Priscilla are there, and they're basically, there's a church that started there. And okay, uh, we don't know how many people are there at the moment of time. But uh, this is before it exploded in Acts chapter 19. But there's a, there's a church there, and Achille and Priscilla had been discipled. And if you would, they had been prepared and trained. And I just imagine they served the Lord there. And Achille may have done the preaching. And Achille probably, and Priscilla together probably did the discipling. But he did the preaching there. And uh, but they, did, they did ministry similarly as Paul. Uh, they went to the synagogue. If they got an opportunity to speak or share, they started to just work, work the ropes with people in the synagogue. And one day at the synagogue, this man comes up, a very, very eloquent, prolific speaker. His name was Apollos, and uh, he started preaching. The Bible says in Acts 18, 26, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. And so he took opportunity of that, his opportunity to stand up and speak. And he had a way with words. He was just a very powerful speaker of the word of God. And he started speaking boldly in the synagogue. And the more they heard him preach and teach, teach the word, they recognized, the Bible says, and when they heard, they took him unto them and expounded him the way of God more perfectly. Now, here is what Achille and Priscilla did. They saw this man in Apollos, and the first thing they did is they received him. The Bible says they took him unto them. That means they received him. They received him with hospitality. They received him with gratitude. They received him with grace. Now, as we read through this, we understand that Achille and Priscilla, as they were there, they had a home somewhere there in Ephesus. They had a lodging place. They, they had enough money to pay for these type of things. It could very well be they invited Apollos to live with them. The Bible says they received him. You know, I, I go to some places, and unfortunately, it's part of our Western, Western culture, that sometimes you can go to places and preachers are not very well received or not received at all. And I've been to some places where they're just, where they they just they only receive the well-known personalities or the guy that's kind of out there on Twitter a little bit there or Facebook, and they're kind of well-known on things. If you're a nobody, they just don't receive you, are not acknowledged. And that's not really what, the way they did things in the New Testament. Basically, uh, people were well-received, and receiving one another was part of Christian hospitality. And so we go there, and we see that they, they received him. They, imply, they, they, they exercised kindness and concern and desire to help him. I think about what Paul said about Philemon in, in the one chapter of Philemon, verse 17. He says, if thou count me therefore part partner, receive him as myself. He was telling Philemon, who had some misgivings in his heart towards uh, Onesimus, he says, now I know Onesimus messed you up. I know he cost you money. I know that, yet, that you could exercise your Roman rights and have him killed for leaving you because he was your slave. But he says, if you consider me in fellowship like yourself, if you consider me, consider me a partner with you, we consider me, our, we're, 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 our hearts are together. He says, then I encourage you to receive Onesimus even as you would receive me. That's the idea that Paul is giving here about, or the Bible is giving here, about Achille and Priscilla receiving Apollos. They received him. They took him under their wings. So they were gracious. You know, our, our attitude sometimes, and I'm, I'm probably guilty, if not more than anybody else, is that if somebody comes up and they make a mistake or whatever there, we kind of just shun them away or whatever there, and that's not really what we're supposed to do. Rather, instead here, they say, well, we know, we realize we're listening to his preaching, and, and uh, he needs, he doesn't know that he's, he's coming up a little bit short there. He doesn't realize Jesus has come, and Jesus died on the cross, and, and there's more than just John, John the Baptist and John's baptism, and that's all good, but he's, they were saying, he doesn't know about this because he's been down in Alexandria where all the corruptions happened down there in Egypt there. He says, he, does, he doesn't know about these things, and somebody needs to help him. They thought, man, and they probably sat there listening to him preach. They thought, man, 
If this guy could know right doctrine, and if he could know everything that's good about it, man, can you imagine how God can use him? Can you imagine how powerful a preacher of the word of God he could be? And so the Bible says they received him. But notice something else. They respected him. They saw that he was a bold preacher of the word of God, and so they respected him. They went to him, and they said, listen, you are a great preacher of God's word. But they did something else. They respected him. They received him. But they became a resource to him. The Bible says they took him unto them. They received him. They respected him. And the Bible says they expounded. That means they they opened up the word of God. They said, now we understand where you're at. You, under, you only know about John's baptism. And so they took whatever, the word of God that was known at that time, that was written and revealed. The Bible says they expounded him the word of God. What I believe they did was they took the Old Testament prophecies about Jesus Christ and about John the Baptist from Isaiah chapter 40 about John the Baptist and Malachi chapter 3 about John the Baptist. I think they took those Old Testament prophecies and they showed how all this was fulfilled and executed. I really believe that the time that Achille and Priscilla spent with the Apostle Paul, they already were very Bible literate, but they went from here to up to there, being around Paul. I mean, being around Paul because he was a prophet of God. They just learned the word of God. I mean, they grew in discipleship. They sucked up all they could. They soaked up all they could from the Apostle Paul. And I just want to just say this in part here and say this. As young people, as people trying to grow in the Word of God, you ought to get around the older men. You ought to get around people who know the Bible. You ought to ask questions. You ought to not be hesitant about that. You want to learn everything you can about the Word of God and grow in it. I'm, I'm very thankful. One of our members this week just contacted me and says, Pastor, that I want to get, I want to get copies of the notes of the sermons the last, the last month or so. I just realized that there's just so much the Bible that's been preached in the last month. I need to learn the Bible. How can I get access to notes and things like that? Well, that's a good sign. That's somebody that wants to grow in the Lord. If all we do is we come, we sit there, and we just kind of soak it up, I tell you, from within 30 seconds from when I walk from here out that door, I'm going to forget more than 50% of what I said, and you're going to probably forget more than 75% of what I said, because of the time you go out that door into your, into your car, you don't remember any of that. But when you have a heart for God's Word, you want to retain as much. Why? Because it's like Dr. John R. Rice taught Russell Anderson years ago. Russell Anderson was just started as a new Christian. He was a multimillionaire. He owned a substantial amount of property in Ypsilanti, Michigan back in the 60s, and he said, Dr. Rice, I'm reading the Word of God, but he says, I'm finding that well, just to learn the Word of God, to learn these things, I'm spending five, six, seven eight hours at a time on it. He said, Russell, that's good. He says, as long as you're studying, you are storing. As long as you're studying, you're storing. And I want to remind you tonight that everything you hear, everything you get, whatever you're studying, whatever you hear, you're storing it up for a future period of time for God to work and develop in your life there. And so this, they took what they have, and they took them, and they, they expounded him the way of God more perfectly. He realized that John the Baptist was the sedgeway for the Lord Jesus Christ. He was preparing the way for Christ. And when Jesus came, Jesus came to die for our sins, and he was so happy to hear that Christ did come and Christ did die, and Christ rose again from the dead, and they were, he was so excited to hear that he, he had ascended up to heaven, and about what the Holy Spirit did on the day of Pentecost, and how the church started to mushroom and grow, what God did there at the church at Jerusalem, and now how it expanded out in other places, and even led to how the church now was getting planted there at the, at the city of, of Ephesus there. I mean, they came to him and became a great help to the man by the name of Apollos. He was, they were such a help to him, you go to the next verse, Acts 18:27. And it says when Apollo slept there, it says that the church at Ephesus felt this way about him. They said he had helped them much. He had helped them much. He was helped. They were helped. Now, when you minister, you're not filling time. You're to help them much. You're to help them much. That's the attitude. That's the attitude you should have. But we see a second thing tonight. They were not only helped to Paul, secondly, really quickly, would you notice they were helped to the local church at Ephesus. Now, I want you to think with me, all the impressions going on on Achilles Priscilla's mind, they had never been part of a church plant. They, they were basically layman evangelists that were down there in Rome preaching the gospel. We don't really know if there was a church they were part of there. The Bible doesn't tell us that. Could be. So they're now down here at, Eph at, at Corinth with Paul, and they saw Paul operated in the synagogue, his strategy for getting the gospel out. They saw how Paul reached a point where he had to just, he could no longer minister through the synagogue. It was not possible anymore. You know, there's just some things and methods, some methods that come to a period of time, they're no longer useful. 
And we have to be flexible enough to let the strategy of God kind of have its place. I mean, it's kind of like right now, we're, we're dealing with shelter in place and all these other type of things that, that uh, are trying to preclude the ability, our ability of witnessing the way we used to. It doesn't mean we shouldn't. It just means it precludes it a little bit there. And so we, we have to be a little bit more creative about our strategies there. And so they see Paul leaving leaving the synagogue, and so the first question comes to mind, where are you going to go? And he goes right next door because there's a man by the name of Justice who said, hey, Paul, he said, I believe what you're talking about here. Why don't you come over to my house? I'm right next door to the synagogue, and you can, you can come here. And so Justice opened his house. Now, I want you to understand this tonight. Justice opened his house as a church meeting place. Now, when we think of church, we think of church, okay, I have a 10 o'clock service, so I'm, and, I'm, and for those of you watching live stream, just imagine with me, you're back here at in-person service. So imagine with me, you know, you come, you, we think of church, you know, you just drive up to the parking lot, you park your car, and uh, then you, you say hello to people, and you shake their hands, and, and you know, we had a prayer group last night, and, and uh, the, one of the men that was praying with me said, you know, Lord, it's going to be so good when we can go around the church and shake hands again, and everybody said amen to that, because we're looking forward to that one day. But, you know, you go around and shake hands with a few people, and then you sit down, and you sing a little bit, and the words scriptures are being read, you hear testimony, you have a little more prayer, we take up the offering, and then we have preaching the word of God, and then we stand up, and we have the benediction, we dismiss, and, and um, when days of Sunday school, you may go to Sunday school class, and then after that, you go home. I mean, that's how we do church in Western world. That's not how they did church then. You know, people in church those days, they stayed at church all day. And a person opened their home up, that was a great risk, because it was no longer your home. I mean, from the rising sun, to the going down the same, or to the last person left, which in those days, people didn't leave. <laughs> They stayed there. And so, Eastern hospitality, you better have a lot of food there, amen? You better have a lot of pupusas, amen, you know? You better have a lot of food. People hang out. Then he go. They watched this man, Justice, open his house up, and there was something about when he opened his house, they saw this hospitality, they saw this loving kindness, they saw this generosity, they saw this stewardship on the part of Justice, and uh, he opened his house up, and they saw the breakthrough that God gave. The breakthrough was as soon as that happened, the very first uh, per person that got saved was a man by the name of Crispus. Crispus got saved, and then it says, many of the Corinthians believed and were baptized. So you know what, what's in their mind? They go to Ephesus, and they say, okay, Paul, we need a place to stay. We'll get a place. And we're, we remember what you did with justice, you can use our house. Now, that's just how they did things those days, okay? They didn't, have, they, didn't, they didn't think like we do. They didn't do things like we do in our Western world. And so they, they opened their home up. And so they opened their home up, and, and it was a meeting place, maybe for a long period of time as far as we know. It was a, lo- it was a meeting place for many, many people. And they, their home was a place where the church got started, and God blessed, and people were getting saved. You know, when they did that, you know, as we w- look at them as a help to the local church at Ephesus as, we, we, as this message unfolds, you notice that they exemplified sacrificial stewardship. They exemplified humility and service. Uh, they did not see opening their home up as an opportunity to promote their own kingdom or their own message. And while Paul was away, they knew that one day Paul would come back, and they wanted to make sure that they would, have, they would show that, you know, that, the, that the church grew while he was away and souls were being added and things of that nature. And they realized that that home would not be their home. It would just basically be a place where they could eat and sleep. And basically, if somebody came at the middle of the night and needed help, they would open their home at the middle of the night. I think that gives come the seed thought in Luke chapter 11 about, about the man who comes knocking on the door. I've got a friend here who needs some bread. I think, I think they realized if we do this, we realize it's not our home. We do not have privacy. We don't have our own hours. We're going to be awakened, we're going to be awakened late in the night and early in the morning. And we're going to just, you know, people may assemble the door who are, who are homeless. And people may assemble the door who are broke, orphans and widows. And we're going to have to feed them and all these things there. But regardless of that, that became the daily meeting place of the church from sunup until sundown. The last person left. It was the place where the church was birthed and grew every single day of the week. It was the hub for the work of the gospel. It was not an entertainment center. It was an evangelistic center. It was not a playground, it was praying ground. I mean, they just learned. They were helped to the church at Ephesus. And as we unfold this, we see later on that those churches gave thanks to, to them. And by the way, we see that, that the church revolved itself around Achilla Priscilla, but Achilla Priscilla revolved himself around the church. They were helped to the local church at Ephesus. Now, what am I saying there? Every one of us must be a help to the local New Testament church. It's our church. It's our church. Every married couple should embrace, it's my church. We're going to serve God here. We're going to be available, whatever's needed, to get the ministry done. Not kind of how I feel about it. It's just how they did things in those days. That's why there was explosive growth in that first and second century, because the way they did things, they realized, it's not mine, it's God's. But they were also helped to Paul. 
I can't help but think they helped him financially. They were a constant encouragement to him. They helped him faithfully. Uh, they sailed with him to Ephesus. And by the way, when he asked them, they didn't say, well, we need to pray about it. They just said, yeah, we'd be glad to go. <laughs> so nothing to pray about. Wherever you go, God's going to bless. We're going to go with you. You know, we, just, we will go with you for God's with you is what they said. Uh, they helped him prayerfully. And let me tell you this tonight. You don't get a heart for someone like Paul unless you pray for him continuously. That's why we're having prayer groups. You need to get a heart for your church. You want to get a heart for missions. You want to get a heart for maybe the 1040 window. You get a heart for the church ministry. You're not going to get a heart for anybody or anything if you don't pray for them. Listen, the best thing you could do for your marriage, married couples, the more you pray for your spouse, the more you pray for your children, you watch what God's going to do in that situation there. I think about Kill and Priscilla, their help to Paul. They were his go-to people without reservation. That's, we find him doing that over and over again. They helped him so he could devote more time to people, more time to the preaching of the word of God. Uh, they, they were the extra set of eyes, ears, hands, and feet that every, every minister of God needs in the church. They helped him carry the burden of the apostle Paul. Whatever was needed to advance the gospel, they kind of stepped up alongside Paul and said, Paul, we know what the goal is here. We don't need to revisit it. We don't need to read a mission statement. We know what the goal is here. Tell us what you need so that you can get out and get more of the work of the gospel. Done. And I think that's why Paul was at that place at Ephesus. He could, he could confidently ask them, hey, I need to turn the church over to you for a period of time. I need to go back. I feel like these churches that I've been to need a report. I need to build them up. Would you care for them? Because he had the care of all the churches on his heart, the Bible says. And so he left with them. And they did a great job. They didn't disappoint him by any means. But he could trust them. He knew that he could put his heart in that. They were a very valuable resource to Paul. Listen, strong churches are made up of spiritually minded people and couples especially who are the preachers, helpers to the Lord. I want to challenge every married couple in Heritage Baptist Church, every married couple to roll up your sleeves and just get your hands ready and decide, you know what, I'm going to do more for my church than I've ever done before. I want to be committed to serving the Lord, being a help and blessing, to be a model of serving, to be a model of a godly testimony, to be a model of a light in the world. I want to, be, I want to just be that model of what it should be. I want to encourage every single person to realize that you're not, that you're, as you have, you're, you're thinking about getting married one day, you're not going to get married for the sake of getting married or because you want to fall in love, whatever. But I'm praying that your, your really desire is that you would have a, you'd have a companion of the Lord that you can serve God with together that would be your prayer partner and soul winning partner and your partner that would help you in church. I want to challenge every married couple to realize the bedrock of a church, the strength of a current church is founded in those married couples. Married couples with families give stability. They give, they give a foundation. They, give, they, give, they just give so much to a church that helps the church. And thank God tonight, we've got many churches. In fact, I think about the majority of our founding members and those who, got, who came along a few years after, majority of our founding members, they're still here and they're the bedrock and they're the foundation for Heritage Baptist Church here. They're the reason why we have strength and depth and areas they would, would not otherwise have. They're the reason why financially the church is undergirded because they began giving in those early days and sacrificing. And a lot of them didn't have jobs and now they have jobs, but they just learned to give. They started sacrificing what little they had. And some of them started off very small in their job, but now God has blessed them and used them in a great way because they got it on their heart that we need to be a married couple that's committed not to building our own kingdom, not to taking a ministry and feeling like it's our ministry, but realizing it's God's ministry and we have a great responsibility with it. I mean, married couple need to coalesce together and realize together if we can pray together and serve together. Can you imagine with me tonight if we had 200 married couples at our church on fire for God. I'm saying on fire for God like Aquila and Priscilla and we're separated so many Christians that were just King James people that just said we're going to do whatever the preacher says the vision is. Listen, we're going to go out and get it done because it's all about Jesus Christ. We need married couples that are just on fire for God. And the nature of we disciple couples is we want couples to get that idea. Now, if you come from a church that doesn't believe that, that's fine. But I want you to know what we believe. Amen? And I want you to know what, it's on my heart. You say, well, preacher, you're, people won't have a family. Let me tell you something. The happiest families I know are people, families are serving God in the church. They're not unhappy. They love the Lord. They're excited about it because they're building their lives around the work of God. And they realize that's where they want to be. But notice thirdly, real quickly, would you notice we see they were heirs together, they were helpers, but you notice what Paul said in Romans 16, 3. They, they, I want you to notice the hazardous. Now Paul made the statement in Romans 16 that is very sobering. He said, who have for my life laid down their own necks. 
Now, we're not really told what they did. Was it a riot at Ephesus where this happened? Was it at Corinth? Was it somewhere else? What they did was hazardous. Now, I want you to think with me for just a minute. Are you so committed to Jesus Christ and to the local New Testament church and its pastor that you'd put your neck on the line? You'd make that kind of sacrifice? Let me, let me give you some thoughts of what, what it meant for them. They were not ashamed of being associated with Paul. Do you notice, as our president has had a, he's had a rough time, and I'm not here to extol his virtues or dispel them either way, but if you notice all the people that have been around him that are disassociating themselves from him, fair weather friends. Paul got later on in life in 2, Corinthians 4, 2 Timothy 4, when they knew his neck was about to be chopped, he says, no man stood with me. They abandoned him. This couple was not ashamed of being associated with Paul. They were not afraid of proclaiming Christ with Paul. They accepted the risk of being his co-laborers. They defended his preaching, the doctrines of the scriptures, and the friendships they held dear to their hearts. Now, I'll, t I'll tell you right now, I'm, I'm pretty strong about certain things, I'm, and I'm not going to make apologies, but I was going to say I'm sorry. I'm not going to say I'm sorry. I'm very strong about certain things I believe in. And along the way, you find out people that they sit there, they're not really on the same page with you about you know, why we're not Calvinists, and we're not Calvinists, amen, okay? We believe in soul winning and, you know, preaching the word of God. But you find over a period of time who's with you, not with you. But I find over time that if you're not careful what you read, I can tell where people are not really on the same page, where they're sinning, who they're hanging out with, what they're posting on social media, there's silence or lack of silence. You know what's going on. But not this couple. Now, let me say this about Paul. Paul was not an easy person to get along with. He was a type A personality. Type A personalities are very difficult to have a friendship with. They're always on the go. Their mind is moving a, mile, a million miles a minute. I mean, they're on the go. They're just, you know, and for some people, if you're type B, you're like, I don't want to be around this guy. Or he's too hyper for me. Or he's too, he's too evangelistic for me. Or he's too separated from me, whatever it may be. And so, you know, I, I imagine Achille and Priscilla, they endured criticism uh, just like he did because they were associated with him. Now, we got some young men and young ladies in Bible colleges. You're going to get criticized for the college you go to. They're going to say, oh, you, you know, you're, you're this and you're that, you're this. And you know what? You ought to defend your college. You know, those colleges you go to, they're all Bible. Those, the, where, where our young people go to Bible college, they're all good Bible colleges. And you should defend those Bible colleges. And you should defend their presidents. And you should defend, the, you should defend those people for standing true. Because I'll tell you, I know those men, and they agree with what we agree with. We're on the same page about you. You ought to defend them. Listen, if somebody starts bad-mouthing your church, you ought to defend your church. You ought to defend your church. In fact, you ought to smack them across the lips if they, they bad-mouth the church, okay? I didn't tell you to do that, but that's, that's how the Lord leads you, okay? They put their necks on the line when insurrections occurred, or maybe when he was attacked by the evil beast at Ephesus. They put their necks in line for Paul and the gospel. They knew what they were getting into when they decided to be his helpers. Listen tonight, you don't need to make a plunge if you're still thinking about it, but I, I think if you've been around the church long, you should know what you've gotten into when you got to Heritage Baptist Church, amen? And you should know what you're getting into is about the Lord's business and advancing the cause of Christ, and realizing that things just don't happen. You may have come from a church where somebody else took care of things. I want to encourage you there. In this church, everybody takes a part in everything because everybody should have ownership in what goes on at the church here because it's God's church. It was always on the go. They knit their hearts with him and laid their necks on the line for him. Here was a couple willing to first lay their necks on the line for Jesus. And Paul defined it this way. He says, now, he says, he's writing to the church in Rome. He says, I want you to know, I want you to know this couple has been willing to put their neck on the line 
for my life. He says, I've watched what they did. I didn't ask them to do it. I did not expect it. But that's the extreme they went to about how much they cared about what was going on there. And I think it was all, goes back to that early day when they, when they met together and they, shared, they just shared stories. They realized why they were both in Corinth together. And the more they, they got around Paul and they watched what he, what he was doing, they just realized this man's consistent all the way through. And even where he's inconsistent, even where he's got faults and everybody's got faults, they decided, you know what? That's not what bothers us. We know the man is moral. We know the man is ethical. We know the man is living for God. We know he's under attack. Everybody's against him. In fact, we read later on in 2 Corinthians about his apostleship being attacked. I mean, I don't know about you, but can you imagine the grief that Paul had to go through and some of his friends not coming alongside of him because his apostleship was under attack and he was being called a fraud and all these other bad things they were saying about him. Can you imagine living in those days? I mean, some of us here today, a part of Heritage Baptist, maybe some of us would have asso- disassociated ourselves from Paul by, th- by listening to those type of things, but not Achille and Priscilla. Hot, uh, through thick and thin, they stayed with him. I'm just saying tonight, they assumed and they, they took upon themselves the hazardous that was involved with the ministry. Finally, one last thing would you notice is notice the homage. Here's what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 16, 19. The churches of Asia salute you. Now, first thing Paul says, I want you to know something, Corinth, because they were hurting. I mean, they were really hurting. And after Paul lovingly but firmly told them about what was wrong with the church, and there were a lot of things. I mean, there were doctrinal problems, moral problems, legal problems. After that, it was all done. They probably thought among themselves, man, we probably look really bad in society. You know, Paul tells them here to encourage them. He says, the churches of Asia salute you. Help our church keep a good name. I said, help our church keep a good name. The Church of Asia salutes you. Achille and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord. They're at Ephesus. Paul's telling them, hey, I'm, I'm writing this letter. Do you have anything you want to say? They said, tell them we salute them much. Now, the word salute, some of you have studied it out. It's a good word in the Bible. It's a word of greeting. It's used 60 times in the New Testament. It means to show due respect. It literally has the idea of embracing and greeting. You know, we, you actually, when you see salute someone, there's always the idea of a holy kiss with that. Um, it means to give a joyous welcome and greeting to. It's a gesture that tells people you're greatly missed or you're greatly welcome. And so, Kayla Priscilla said this, tell the church at Corinth, we salute them much. We miss them much. Let them know our greetings. Tell them if we could be there, we want to be there so badly. Let them know we miss them. Let them know they're in our heart. Let them know that we're praying for them. They saluted them much. It's a gesture that tells people that they're loved. It's a killer Priscilla down there at Ephesus. I can imagine this. You can imagine this. Paul's gone. A killer's at the pulpit. And a lot of the, as he's teaching through the Bible, a lot of his stories are about, oh, let me tell you about some good things about the church of Corinth. Let, let me tell you about the salvation of Crispus. Let me tell you about the salvation of Stephanus. Let me tell you about Fortunatus. And Achaia. Hey, let me tell you about this family here. And he probably used them as sermon illustrations along the way and talked about it. And listen, they, he, he, he talked about the church at Corinth, the good things about the church at Corinth so much, that the church at Ephesus embedded in their mind were all these wonderful thoughts and people and names. They knew these names. They knew these people. And so when, when, when Paul was writing there, it was first the church at Ephesus. They said this, hey, listen, tell, in fact, all the churches of Asia, because at that time, the churches had exploded in growth there and they were all over the place. We get the seven churches of Asia Minor there. And they said, tell the church at Corinth we send our wonderful greetings. Now, none of them probably had ever been to Corinth. But they said, tell them, to send them our greetings. Let them know that we love them very, very much in the Lord. And I, I'll tell you right now, I attribute the good spirit of the church at Ephesus to the fact that Achille and Priscilla had a good spirit about the church at Corinth as well there too. Notice the second thing, we're done. Paul... And the churches extended their thankfulness to Achille and Priscilla. Romans 16, 4, as we close. He says, who have for my life laid down their own necks. Listen to this. Unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Boy, that's, that's great. Can you imagine the reputation Achille and Priscilla had? He said, all the churches of the Gentiles. 
all the churches of the Gentiles, I'm thinking Paul's missionary journeys, they said, we send you greetings to kill and Priscilla. They had a good reputation, a very good name. Churches are blessed when there's Achilles and Priscilla's. Paul's closing letter, 2 Timothy 4.19, he said this, salute Priscilla and Achilla. Their chief business was the business of God's man in the church. They did not practice hero worship, nor do we advocate that. They had a clear understanding of how they had a critical support role in the church. They did not have a problem being go-to people. They revolved their lives around the church and not the church around them. I close tonight. Will you be an Achilla, Priscilla at the church, our church? Will you be an all-weather servant and helper? Will you put your neck on the line? Will you be somebody that can be counted worthy, whose name will go way beyond your local church as being 